Well, good morning. Thank you for coming. We are in Romans chapter 2. We'll try to get down through verses 1 through 6. Last week we read through the whole chapter of Romans chapter 2, looked at kind of an overview. Um, I would tell you this. Uh, we're going to see today, as we look in chapter 2, Paul's building on the concept of, from chapter 1, where there was general revelation, all man, so all mankind is accountable, and they willfully uh, neglected the knowledge that's been revealed in general revelation, which is creation. Chapter 2, he's going to move into what we could say special revelation things revealed to the Jews uh, through scripture, prophets, apostles, uh, but... It, it doesn't begin specifically with that. In, I write these down. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, the discussion there is going to be, it, it can refer to anybody in a general sense. It, it, commentators kind of navigate through it. Are they talking specifically about the Jews? Modern commentators come down on the side that they, he is talking to the Jews in chapter 2. The Gentiles, chapter 1, the Jews in chapter 2. But as we begin chapter 2, it, it's not real clear in the first 11 verses if it's the Jews or not. It's kind of just like a general idea. If you have enough sense to pass judgment on someone else and say, hmm, that's not right. But now remember right here, I wrote this down, this is important. Judgment makes an evaluation, but it doesn't always have to be negative. You could see when we say you shouldn't judge people, you know, that's a buzzword, a buzz phrase, popular in contemporary Christianity. Don't judge, don't judge. That means don't be negative. But the real concept of being able to judge is also positive. In other words, you're very able to say, hey, they're doing it right. That's a judgment. So if you have the ability to say, I approve of that, or I disapprove, either way, you're making a judgment and you've got some basis of ability, some kind of a revelation. If it's general revelation, Paul's going to talk about that here in these, these early verses. Or if it's from biblical revelation, scriptural revelation, you're making a, I approve of this behavior, I disapprove of that behavior. That is judgment. So when we talk about judgment, we, we don't want to just always be negative. The word wrath is going to be used when, God talks, when Paul talks about God's wrath as a negative evaluation. But even the ability to be positive and judging your own self. Hey, I did it right, or I didn't do it right. You're now judging. And so in chapters 1, or chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, he's talking about all mankind, in a sense, have some ability to judge and evaluate. And the very fact that you're able to evaluate others, uh-oh, you should be evaluating yourself. Which, again, goes back to the point in chapter 1, the wrath of God is being revealed to mankind. In general revelation... But even in special revelation, when you say, well, I, I think I know what's right and what's wrong. Okay, well, then some people are failing and some people are approved, which indicates you'd better watch yourself because you have the ability to discern. So chapters uh, 2, verse 1 through 11 is general accusation. Uh, it could go through gener gener Gentiles or Jews. Chapter 12, or chapter 2, verses 12 through 16, we now introduce the concept of law. And Paul even here is going to say, and again, we're, he's pushing towards the Jews. It's going to be very clear by the end of the chapter, he's talking to the Jews. But he begins, first of all, just kind of a general. If you have the ability to judge people, you should judge yourself. You're, you're under God's judgment. You, you know this. Then chapter uh, 1, verses 12 through 16, the concept of law, meaning some kind of written revelation. And Paul's even going to say it's written on our hearts. I mean, you don't need the law of most of what's right and wrong. He's going to attack this in two senses. He's going to talk this on the... On the, on the written form of the law, but also on circumcision. I mean, there's something bigger going on here than just following a, a legalistic code. It's to guide you into what's right and what's wrong. And then very clearly in 17 uh, through, what is it, 29, he's going to make specific application to the Jews. He's going to now call the Jews out. He begins the chapter using a word, you, and this is important. And again, as always, you don't have to, you know, I'm, I'm teaching you, I'm giving you some insight, some things to deal with. Uh, you're, you're free, of course, to disregard this and think maybe I gave you too much information, it's, it's not useful. But the word you, and again, I am not a Greek scholar that I haven't gone to the mountaintop and uncovered all these things. I've read some books, okay, they're available to you also. You can pick them up on Amazon.com and just read the book and you don't have to come to, from the Bible study, read it yourself. But the word you that begins here is in the, the second person singular. And what has taken place here, and many commentators agree with this, it's an individual. It's, it's, he's setting up a, a, an opponent. He says you. He's not talking specifically to the Roman Christians. 
Because that would have to be plural. This is singular, meaning he's talking to, he's setting up an opponent. It's called a, a diatribe. D-I-A-T-R-I-B. It's, it's a form of argument. Paul uses it many times in his writings. James used it. The writers of the Greek world at that time used it to prove their point. We do it. You see it in opinion pages and stuff. You set up a, a, a person. You you say this, but here's if you're saying that, here's the truth. And here's something to consider. So he's not talking about you people. He's not talking about that when it says you. He's not saying you Jews. He's saying you, you man. He's not saying you Romans reading my letter. He's saying you, this individual. So he's going to begin here by addressing this person, you, who is possibly going to be debating Paul back. Is and it's, it's all, uh, how would you say it, it's all truthful, it's all accurate, but it's not necessarily a, a specific individual. He's, he's building a case for the readers to follow him along. And I think you can see this. Um, if we look on, uh, I can show you this. In fact, if you look at page two of your notes, uh, I say right here, Paul begins with the second person singular, you. Paul is using a style called the diatribe. And you can see this. I would love to take you through this, but I think it'd be, it'd be exciting for me, but really boring for you. Uh, you can see this is going to, I want you to grab a hold of this because it's going to pop up in chapter 2, verse 17. He's going to do it again. Chapter 8, verse 2. He'll do it. These aren't written in your notes. Chapter 9, verse 19 and 20. Chapter 11, verse 17. Chapter 13, verses 3 through 4. And then chapter 14, when he gets into some deep, deeper thoughts there. Chapter 14, verse 4, 10, 15, 20 through 22. He's still arguing with this you. And it's, it's this individual that's not necessarily a real opponent, but it's a figure that we all can relate to. And he's, he's demonstrating a, a, a debate in, in throughout this, throughout this, this book. Um, and again, it's, it's a typical literary style. Uh, let's go ahead and read chapters. Well, let's just read chapter 2, verses 1 through uh, 11. And I'm going to try to get today through chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. But let's begin to read this. Chapter 2, verse 1. There it is. You. Now, what does what anybody else have different? That's the NIV translation. Anybody else have something? Some would say, oh, man, are different ways of saying this. But it's, 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 again, in the Greek, that is a singular, second person singular, you. So he's talking to one person, and it's probably he's setting up a straw man to begin the debate. I would, you know, and again, that's not just my idea. That's many commentators. But it's worth discussing. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when the righteous, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. I'd like to get that far this week, and then next week we'll pick up in the, you know, chapter verse 7. So let's go back to chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore, the, again, the singular you, therefore... Again, that means he's building on what was already written. And so at some point, and it's, I don't want to say it's confusing, but it's not a, a slam dunk. Because he's just continuing on from chapter 1. Therefore, is he referring back to that list of sins, like in verse 29, chapter 1? And you're able, to, you're able to identify wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, all those things. He says, yes, yes, those are sins. We agree, Paul, those are sins. Okay, then you, who are able to distinguish that those are sins... Are you able? Again, he's not talking to the Roman readers, but he's aiming towards the Jewish people. So he's got the Gentiles and the Jews. But again, this is very general. This can apply to the Roman readers. This, this could apply to the Roman Christians who are reading the letter. This can apply to any one of us today. This, but he's, he's in his writings, he's aiming towards the Jews. He's making a contrast. So if you're able to look at our wicked culture, you know, and I, I can stand and say, look at what they're doing. Yes, that's wrong, that's immoral, that's coming against God's reality. Okay, well done, Galen, you've proven you know God's law. Yes, I can tell you that's wrong. Okay, now you, how are you doing? Can you judge yourself? Well, I'm not as, I'm like, you, know, you know where this is going. Well, I'm not like that, I, I'm still holding a certain line. 
Yeah, but let's get deeper. His whole point is going to be universal sin. If you have the fact, just like some people have general revelation in chapter 1, you, you it, on purpose suppress the knowledge of the truth of God so you can go your own way. We, who are able to look at the world and say, ah, look, they're wrong, but now in our own world we can suppress our own truth that God's revealing to us and go our own way or suppress the revelation. And again, he's aiming this eventually towards the Jews. But at this point, it, it can be, it's, it's wide open. Now, Again, the therefore is pointing towards those sins in chapter 1, verse 29, or is it over chapter 1, verse 18? You can consider this too. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That may be the connection. In other words, he's proven that the world is suppressing God's general revelation, but now you, therefore, you're doing the same. Yeah, but we've got a Bible. Yeah, but you're doing the same thing. And eventually, like I said, this is heading towards the Jews. But even though we've got the special revelation, we twist it, we manipulate it, we cut out parts we like, we get rid of things we don't like, and we make it appeal to our own sense. We form our own idol by taking part of God's revelation, cutting out part that we don't want or suppressing it, and lifting up the part that we do like. So in other words, we're all in trouble with God's revelation, be it general or be it special. Chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore... You have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. And again, that word judgment does not necessarily have to be negative. Saying, oh, that's wrong. You might be saying, oh, that's right. This politician is better than this politician because this politician does this and this politician. It's like you're making a decision. I approve of this. Well, can you reflect that on yourself? And Paul's saying Absolutely, you certainly can. You have no excuse. The phrase, no excuse or have no excuse, is a technical legal term in Greek writing. It means without reasonable defense. You have no defense. And that's very similar to chapter 1. They are without excuse. Now chapter 2. You, If you have the ability to judge and say that's right and that's wrong, now you have no ability. You now have, you're in a position now where you have no way to defend yourself once you make a judgment. Now this is not saying, now be careful as I say all these things, this is not saying, as so many in our culture want us to say, don't judge. It's just telling you that because you have the ability to make a distinction between right and wrong, you better straighten up because you do know and God is going to hold you accountable. Just like God's going to hold you accountable for knowledge of himself and general revelation. Okay, you better face the fact there is a creator and better get on with the right terms with him. That doesn't mean now in the special revelation that when you say, well, that, that doesn't agree with the Bible and this does. Well, you shouldn't judge. No, that doesn't mean don't judge. We have to judge what's right and what's wrong. We have to discern. Paul tells all that. In fact, he says, separate yourself from those who cause division. Paul encourages you. Jesus tells you, you have to judge, you have to make a decision, but it's to get closer to the truth. Some people want this to mean, don't judge, and Paul's actually accusing you, or telling us, you'd better make a distinction, and because you have the ability to make a distinction, you better turn that inwardly and start judging yourself and getting right with God. There's no room in Christianity to say, let's not be judgmental. We're heading towards that word right here, tolerance. It's coming up, I'm going to give you a biblical definition of tolerance here in just a moment. When we hear, don't judge... It's almost like you're being blamed. Ah, you can tell the difference between right and wrong. You shouldn't be like that. You should be more Christian. Cover your eyes, walk in darkness, and we'll all just get along. It's like, well, that's unbiblical. You should be able to discern right from wrong. And that person's going the wrong way. This person's going the right way. I'm going to follow the right way. Now, that doesn't mean I've got the ability to bring judgment and wrath on that person. But it does mean I'm going to make a distinction. Again, we can push this further. If you are in a position of leadership, if you are in a position of government, you have the stinking responsibility to punish and separate from those who are wrong. You understand the law of Moses. When a person committed a crime, there was justice. Those, all the law of Moses is not just religious regulations. It's a government system. For example, these crimes were met with this kind of punishment. And the people that were in charge of the government, if they neglected their responsibility... Judgment would come upon the land because you're letting the wicked go and not bring in justice. You are, if you're going to accept a position of leadership in a church, in a government, in a family, you're going to have to step up and make a judgment and dispense the correct punishment or the correct correction. Do you understand? We all just can't be just sheep following each other in a, in a blind pattern of just wilderness wandering. 
We'd better make some kind of distinction. If you don't want the responsibility, don't interact with people. And definitely don't become leaders in government. But nonetheless, we continue here. Uh, passing judgment refers to the act of evaluating another. Okay, I'm turning the page here on the notes page. Page two. I'm reading on down through here, seeing where I'm at. Okay, let's go to chapter 2, verse 2. I'll read it in the text of Scripture here. I'll read, I'll read chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 again. You, the individual who he's arguing with, which is an uh, 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 artificial opponent, apparently. Therefore, because of what has gone before, you are in this position. Possibly the wrath of God being revealed to general revelation. Now the wrath of God is revealed to you because you're able to make judgment you know that there's judgment coming for you too. And that judgment could be positive. It is going to be positive by chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. It can be positive. God's judgment of you might be positive. Give me an example. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You may be positive. But nonetheless, you know it's, it's there. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Verse, verse 2, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. The, contest, or the, the contrast here in chapter 2, verse 2, is God is going to bring judgment, but he's judging in truth. And when I say truth, I like to think of the word reality. Uh, and again, don't let me mess up theology here, but truth kind of becomes that abstract truth. Reality is, is what God created from his very existence. This is God's reality. This is God's truth. We live in God's truth, God's reality. And God is going to judge us who are part of his creation based on his character, based on his reality. There's no room for compromise. This is the way it is. It's based on truth. But we as a creature inside this creation... We want to form our own reality. It's called idolatry. And then from that position, we want to send off different judgments. Now, your judgment is based in your own opinion, your own experience, your own idolatrous recreation of what you live in. And that's, that's faulted. All of it's all faulty. Only God is able to you know, see the whole picture, but only God is the one who created reality based on his own nature. So his judgment is based in his truth. Our judgment should try to line up with his judgment or his, his position. So it says right here, just the contrast, chapter 2, verse 2, Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. He's not being impartial, he's being fair. He's looking at it from reality. This is the way it is. So, verse 3, When you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? So just because you're making judgment from your own position, and the point here is getting towards... The, the time of tolerance that we're going, we're going to go to, but you're able to pass judgment. Do you think that God is going to come in and line up with your opinion? Just because you feel comfortable, and, and we do, I do, I feel comfortable justifying myself. As I'm flying through the day, flying through my life, I justify things I do, but then at 3 o'clock in the morning when I wake up and I can't go back to sleep, I lay there and I think, yeah, I better take care of that problem. If it be whatever, does it ever happen to you? And you start... Now, you're no longer just flying through life. You've actually got time that you don't even want. You ever, you've been there where it's like, I wish I could go back to sleep. But you're awake and you lay there and you just think about, oh yeah, I better reckon that, that financial situation. I better reckon that relationship. Oh, I better mow the yard. You know, whatever you're thinking that you've neglected, you're now judging yourself. And so right here, it's easier if you can, every time one of those things pops up, justify yourself. Well, I haven't had time. I don't have a good enough job. Ah, that wasn't my fault. That was that person's fault. Okay, you create your own reality and you go back to sleep. Everything's fine. But it's like, yeah, that wasn't truthful. Though. That just was like some kind, of a, uh, a, some kind of a mental drug you took just to put yourself back to sleep. But eventually you're going to, have to be held accountable for all those things you just suppressed. Remember we talked in chapter 1 about the Gentiles suppressing the truth? Well, that was the truth. Reality is rising up in your heart. It's like, I better deal with these things. No, and you suppress them. Well, I suppress. I'm not sure how you do it, but I go back to sleep eventually. And I hate it when I wake up. And sometimes I wake up with a start. It's like, oh, no, this is going to be about a 45-minute wake. It's like, and you think about everything you can and, and, you know, turn the fan a little bit different direction, you know. Whatever you do to try to get yourself to forget about what you're thinking about. And then you make a note, mental note, I'll take care of that in the morning. 
and then the day starts, you get going again, and you can forget about it again. Okay, you understand what I'm talking about a little bit. That's kind of my interpretation, not, you know, my personal application of this right here. Verse 3, so when you, again, this individual singular person, right now he's talking to me, when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, in this case, those in chapter 1 who are doing these things, that have suppressed the truth of God's revelation, of general revelation, but yet I suppress God's truth in his specific or special revelation, would you, a mere man, do the same thing, a pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? It's like, you, are, you can suppress it, but you're going to one day wake up and you won't be able to go back to sleep. It's going to be face-to-face -face an account with God. Maybe in time, maybe in eternity. But you will have to face, you will not escape God's judgment. Well, why is he not bringing judgment now? Now watch this. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? So what it's talking about here, we're talking about that thing called time. We are in time. God's wrath is being revealed from heaven now. He can deal with it right now. You often under, I wonder sometimes, why didn't we just end this at the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve fell, boom, take them out, we're going on. He, he makes a promise. We move on. we got the Noah's flood. We could just never have, just wipe everybody. Noah doesn't get an ark. Just wipe everybody out, we're done with this problem. But he preserves it, we go on. And we keep pushing this on and on. What is God doing? He's spending or watching over time. In my own life, why doesn't it just end and I have to deal with it? But he, he said, no, 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 I'll just wake you up. Now, I'm not saying God wakes me up, but something's waking me up. I don't know, okay, I'll stop. Uh, but I, 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 you know, I start thinking about these things, and yet nothing happens if I neglect it, if I don't mow the yard in the morning, if I don't reconcile this relationship with this person, whatever. Nothing happens. I just get distracted, keep right on going, but yet it hangs there. It's time. What it's talking about here is this is going to come in the word patience, goodness, the word tolerance. It says, are you despising God's tolerance? And here, let's read this again. And this is where he's going with this. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Don't you think you should change? Or do you show contempt? Again, there's the word contempt in the ideal of you reject it. You count it as worthless. You count it as not worthy of being considered. You maybe are thinking about something, but you just suppress it, just like they suppress general revelation. You're suppressing this idea that you know what's right and wrong. You show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience. In other words, when you wake up to a fact that I need to deal with this, and you don't, you show contempt for the fact that God in time is showing you goodness. He's showing you kindness. He's tolerant. He's saying, okay, I just give me you some time. I could have ended it at the garden. I could have ended it at the flood. I could have ended it when you crucified my son. I could have ended it during the crusades, but I'm waiting, or in your own personal life. Anytime he could have ended and brought judgment, but I'm waiting. And the reason he's waiting is he wants, and you know where this is going, during time, time is basically given to you for you to repent, to ch I mean, change your mind, change your attitude, change your direction, and start walking in obedience. And the more time you get, the more opportunity you have to come to the truth, to reconcile it, and start going God's direction. Start following, first of all, general revelation. There is a creator. He has a reality that he's created that I've got to plug into. There's ranks of authority and ranks of, of way the world is supposed to work. And then there's special revelation. God's shown us the way of eternal life through his son. There's things he wants us to do. He's given us a place in the body of Christ. He's given us a gift. He's given us a direction. He's in power. I mean, it goes all the way from just there's a God to what am I supposed to be doing to serve God in his kingdom today? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a many faceted layer of revelation. During this time you, that he's giving you, he can bring judgment. Remember, it starts off in chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed. It, it's, it's waiting. At the end of the game, there's the wrath. But he's hoping some people will be able to separate from that wrath, join him, and be rewarded instead of coming down with the wrath. So he's giving us time. This lines up with Peter. lines up with Paul's going to say, the more time he gives us, the more repentance we're going to have. But if you don't use this time to evaluate yourself, 
to repent, which means change your attitude. I should have taken care of this a long time ago. Now I am going to take care of it. I repent. I change my attitude and start being obedient. If you don't use that time, you are showing contempt. Say, it don't matter. I'll just party till I die. I'll just live like I want to. I'll live in my false reality until maybe he'll never show up. Maybe I'll never die. Maybe the judgment day will never come. Yeah, that's a good bet. It's like, I wouldn't bet against the IRS. I truly would not want to bet against God. It's like, well, the fact that you're going to be the only person in history that doesn't die. Well, it's like, you understand, you are, if, if you believe that there's a creator, if you believe you're going to see Jesus someday, you better believe there's a day of evaluation. Now, that evaluation, the day of judgment, doesn't have to be negative. It can be positive, but you will be evaluated. Oh, no, no, let's just go get something to eat. Let's just, let's just go, let's, let's go to a ball game or something. Let's turn some music on. It's like you can do that until finally you stop breathing and boom, there's reality. And you've shown contempt for God's goodness. God's will here. Let's read those words again. And I, this is, I'm getting excited now about the word tolerance because I'm about ready to cut loose. <laughs> so when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you, singular you, will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt? Either you think you're going to, here, here's the truth. Either you think you're going to somehow get out of here without being judged, or you're showing contempt for God and his patience and his kindness. You're saying, I don't even care. I'll just do it my way. That's, that's another whole form of, of idolatry. Either you think you're going to escape somehow, which is, that's a false reality, or you are just plain rude enough in God's face to say, I'm not going to change. Do you think you'll escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? In other words, we talk about God's patience, kindness. That's this time period that's supposed to be leading you towards giving you an opportunity. You wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning or you're confronted with somebody else. You're like, you know, I better deal with that. I better deal with that. And finally, you do. And the more time he gives you, the better opportunity of you Repenting of, of whatever it is. Repenting means changing your mind and coming back to reality. Changing your mind from a falsehood, coming back into the truth. And it can happen at many layers. I mean, we can repent of Jesus, or a bad opinion of Jesus Christ, but he was a false prophet, or he was not the Messiah, or was not the Savior. Repent, say, yes, I accept Jesus Christ. Okay, that's one level, that's one phase of repentance. But you, I think that it's a continuous thing of bathing yourself in, okay, Every time you read the word or every time you have an experience in life as far as reality, you're like, oh, I better change my mind. You, you accept Christ, let's say, one time. I, you know, I, I'll hold that. You accept Christ one time, but you continue to repent and come to Christ's truths as they're revealed in Scripture in your life over and over again. I, I'm continually doing it. I assume you are too. The more you learn, it's like, oh, man, I was so smart when I was 20, but I was a Christian. I'd already accepted Christ. But then about 25, it's like, oh, man, I, how stupid was that? And I changed my mind and tried to come into the truth. And it's like, and yesterday I was so smart. So I got up this morning and started studying for today's church service. Like, oh, I need to repent and change my mind. It's a continual, in a sense, repentance. Not always coming to Christ, but coming to Christ's truth. And I'm sure that makes sense to you. Hey, Galen. Yes, sir. Okay. In uh, verse 3, is the you he's talking about there in reference back to the same you in verse 1? I, I, I think so. Okay, then how about in verse 2? Who are the we? Are the we the believers? Those? Oh, good point, good point. And I've got that in the notes here. The we know. That is an argumentative phrase. Uh, and I, let me see. If it, I'll, I'll look at my notes in just a minute. But it's like he's established. It's an argumentative style or move of saying, okay, we all know today is Sunday. Meaning, okay, are we all on the same page? We know. So whoever he's, the readers are reading this, we know this to be true. So he, he's establishing a fact or common ground. Uh, it could also be, see, this, this is a good point that I missed. It. Thank you. We know is used in chapter 3, verse 19. You don't need to write these down. But chapter 3, verse 19, chapter 6, verse 6, chapter 7, verse 14, chapter 8, verses 22 and 25, where he says, we know. And he's, he's throwing that out and saying, okay, before I go any further with this argument, we all agree that this is the truth. And once you bite that part of the apple, it's like, okay, now you're hooked because now I'm going to build on that and you can't get away because we agreed at this. 
it's a, it's a courtroom debate. It's a, it's a debate technique. He also uses knowing in chapter 5, verse 3, chapter 6, verse 19, chapter 13, verse 11. He uses you know in chapter 2, verse 15. And he uses do you not know in chapter 6, verse 3, 16, chapter 7, verse 1, chapter 11, verse 2. So what you just touched on is something that's throughout this book. Just like he's going to set up a singular you arguing with this individual who we're all watching him have this argument with. He's then going to look at us and say, now, we all know you're on my side, right? Okay, let's go back to this individual. So he's, he brings the crowd in on his side, and then he goes back to the attack on the singular individual. And he's, so he jumps back to the person from chapter 1, the reference to the person who was... In, in, in verse 1. Yes. Yeah, verse yeah. throughout this, whenever he says you in these verses right here, he's, he's singular, he's talking about this. Now, again, that's called a diatribe, and many commentators think that's what he's doing. Uh, again, you need to go back, you know, hear this, take a breath, go back, read it again. And it, it's not, he doesn't, he, Paul does not say, I'm arguing with this fictional person here. He, but he's, he, one thing you do have, you have the Greek on your side here. It is not plural. He's not saying, you Roman Christians. He's yeah. not saying, you all Jews. He's saying, you singular, you over here. So that, in verse 3, is back to the singular. The you, singular. yes, yep. Now that's a very good, thank you for catching, that's a very good point. That, that, that's, that helps establish his very debate serious. going on right here. He's, ta- he's arguing against the debate with this individual as a technique. But then he also used that, we all know, we all agree, gets you on his side, and then goes back into the attack mode. And again, he's not, when I say attack mode, he's trying to help these people. He's trying to establish some groundwork. He's trying to lay the truth out for them so you would just follow him right into the truth. He's not trying to crush anybody here. Paul can do that later at different times. So verse 3 again. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? You're either trying to escape or think falsely that you're going to somehow outmaneuver God. Job tried that. (laughs) Or verse 4, or do you show contempt? Or you're just plain rude in God's face, showing contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience. Meaning he's giving you this time. He's not ignorant. He's not hiding. He's not unattentive. He's simply holding back that, back that wrath from Romans chapter 1. Saying, okay, I'm going to give you some time. I've surrounded you with general revelation. I've surrounded you with the revelation of the scriptures. I'm speaking to your heart. Now, what are you going to do? And he's showing you goodness, kindness, tolerance. And again, I'll finish that verse. I'll come back to the word tolerance. Uh, riches, of, uh, riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience. Not realizing, and here's the thing, if, you, if you're if showing contempt, then you don't realize what time is for. You don't realize that God's kindness leads you towards repentance. And again, that word repentance, don't think of it as, you know, stop smoking. You know, it's, it's like repentance from this false worldview of I'm living in my own reality, of I'm repenting, changing my mind, and I'm coming to God's reality. I'm coming from my, my, what I think is truth, to God's truth. And he's giving you time. Go ahead. Touch the burner. Is it hot? Ow, yeah. Did you change your mind now? Do you think you not want to touch that again? Yes, I want to come over here. He's giving you time to repent and change your thinking. Now, if, you're, if you are not responding to that, you're showing contempt for it. Now, the word tolerance. First of all, the word riches means something that is you know, like a treasure. We're going to build on the phrase right here later. We're talking about stored up. The concept would be riches are to be stored up. And so you can be storing up treasures in heaven. We've certainly heard that phrase before. Just don't forget that. I hope I don't forget that. So you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience. Not realize that God's kindness leads you towards repentance. Whenever the word tolerance is used right here, and again, you can disagree with this if you're in the Western world, uh, in the Western media, if you're in the Western education system, the word tolerance means acceptance. We all sin. We all we have no right to judge. You can just see the, you can just hear, feel, smell the greasy, false philosophy in our world system. Don't judge. You do what you want. Just keep ourselves in darkness. We want to be tolerant of each other. Don't, don't, don't judge. I'll accept you. You accept me. That is not the English word for tolerance. For me to be tolerant of you would mean there's something wrong. There's something different. I'll put up with it. Well, here, the Greek word means this. 
Now you can do whatever you want to with this information. Here's the Greek word, anoxine. It means forbearance with suspended punishment. Tolerance, meaning, okay, I don't like this. We're enemies, but we're fighting an a equal enemy over here. So we will be tolerant of each other while we attack this enemy. Or I'll be tolerant of you. Maybe you're a student in my classroom and you keep disrupting my class. I'll be tolerant for a certain time trying to lead you to a place of, okay, this is not how we behave. A lot of times when you get a new student in the class, you kind of have this in my shop class. I kind of have, you know, after a few weeks, a few years, you kind of have this attitude. And when it comes in, it kind of knows the expectations. It's just kind of here. Then a new student comes in, and they're from some other school where they drilled holes in the tables. They didn't do anything in shop class. They used the grinder to grind off the ends of the screwdrivers. It's like, okay, I understand. You're coming from another dimension. Okay, but in our, so I, you just got to play it right. But I'll be tolerant of your stupidity because this is your first day in class. I may try to lead you in and show you some of the other kids and show you some of the projects. Okay, after, but after so long of me being tolerant and you do not change, then I'm going to bring down the wrath of Weemers. And then you're going to have to make a decision now. It's like, whoa, there's more coming if you wanted this. this is, we got the whole school here. I can bring this to you every day. Or do you want to stop cutting off the ends of the screwdrivers and drilling holes in the tables and screwing up everybody else's project? Okay, well, we see there's a repentance. They don't say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They just change their mind. When they come in the next day, they come in like everybody else. They don't drill holes in tables, ruin projects. They just kind of come in and get started on their project. Ah, they didn't say, I'm sorry, write me a big long apology letter and, and weep and cry. They just came in and just like, got it, got it. So they use their time wisely. My time of tolerance, my time of goodness. Tolerance doesn't mean, well, I guess we got a new kid. I'll just let him drill holes in the table. I can't do anything about it. I'll just have to tolerate this behavior. I will tolerate it for a while until there's been enough time for him to realize that's not how we act in the shop. And then I'll have to bring the wrath. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, that's tolerance. I don't like the way the kid's behaving, but he's got to have some time to kind of figure out where he's at and who I am and how we function in the shop. And when people are born into this earth, born into certain families, maybe my family, born into certain countries, there's certain things that they just kind of pick up. It's like, wait, that's not reality. I'll show, you, I'll show you patience. I'll show you the goodness, God says. I'll be tolerant. Uh, Paul uses this in, 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 in Athens. He says, he was tolerant of your ignorance to the Gentiles in Athens on Mars Hill. But now the time has come to repent. He sent the special revelation. He sent Jesus. And that's, that's on, in, in Athens. Okay. Tolerance is not acceptance in the English language, nor is it in this biblical word. It is not agreement. It's not saying, okay, let's just all agree that we all just will do this, this wrong thing. It is suspension of a penalty. The penalty may be imposed later, uh, depending on your use of the time during God's tolerance. So tolerance is very, God, is God tolerant? The very fact that we're still on the planet means he's tolerant. But does that mean he's saying, ah, I just give up. I'll just let you do what you want to, but you all just live happily ever after. It's like, no, I'm tolerant, meaning I'm holding back my wrath, hoping that you'll figure it out with the signs in creation. Again, I don't mean mystical signs. I mean just the fact that there's planet after planet after planet, and the DNA just gets smaller and smaller. It's like, it's like this, there's got to be a creator. Then you begin to seek that creator. You seek him, you will find him, and he's giving you this time to find him. And then you find that there's a creator. He gives you the scripture, and you dig through the scripture, and you read past a few verses. Get past just your favorite refrigerator magnet verse, and you actually get into the text of the scripture, and now you are into having a relationship with the living God through his son, Jesus Christ, empowered by his spirit. You're part of the kingdom. You're part of the church right now, moving and living on the earth, doing God's will, he's so glad he had tolerance while you came from being a fallen dirt creature to be conformed into a son of God, into the very image of his son, and are walking the earth today, ministering to the world. He's happy, more than happy to be tolerant and show you his goodness while you go through this sequence. But if you end up saying, I'm going to show contempt for this, I'm going to live my own way as if there's no creator. I'm going to teach false doctrine that we all just evolved out of dirt, that there's no God, there's no judgment. We die like animals and fade away. 
Well, I'll give you a little more time. I'll give you a few experiences. Do you really think that philosophy is truthful? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, my time of tolerance is over. You showed contempt for my time of tolerance, my time of goodness. And now here comes God's wrath. So the point being, if you use the word tolerant, it simply means we're holding back the penalty, giving you a chance to consider your ways, but there is a penalty coming. There is a confrontation coming. The use of the word tolerance does not mean acceptance. It means the wrath or the judgment is being held back, giving you some time to make a decision. It does mean we accept, now in English, today in our modern world, tolerance is one of the great characters along with just putting up with everything. Just be tolerant. Now in my case, I, I use this in my own life, I'm not going to be the one that brings the judgment. I'll be tolerant of social behavior, however corrupt I may think it is. Because my job here is not to bring the wrath, but my job is to, as all of us at some level, proclaim the truth. So when some people want the truth to be, God is forgiving, God is good, God is not judgmental, come just as you are and never have to change, that's the wrong God. That's false real. That's an idol. Yeah, but we, we praise Jesus. Yeah, you call it Jesus, but that isn't Jesus. That's your own image of Jesus. So my job is to this, not bring wrath and judgment, but to continue to bring the truth, to confront this false definition of tolerance. Tolerance simply means judgment is being withheld to give you a chance to evaluate yourself and repent and come to the light. So during this time of tolerance, I'm going to keep teaching and keep teaching, and that someday I'm going to duck and get out of the way, and the wrath is going to come. You understand? So again, the very fact that we're still teaching the truth is, is uh, we've said before, is one of the greatest things you can do to someone who is in rebellion towards God, showing contempt for God's grace, is to keep showing them the truth because on the day of judgment, that's one of the things I think I'll be held accountable for is did you share the truth? Did you present or did you converse? Well, we want to make sure everyone feels comfortable. Well, you want to make everyone feel comfortable during the time of God's tolerance? That's the very thing. That's why I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and think, I've got these things I've got to resolve in my life. Being comfortable means just going back to sleep. Then one day, I wake up and it's judgment day. I want to be woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning. People want to be woken up to, not everybody want, admits it, but they want to be woken up right here and say, listen, this is the truth. You can put yourself back to sleep if you want to, but this is what's happening. And that's my responsibility. I'm not going to, or neither are you, going to be responsible for bringing God's wrath. God's got that under control. But I'm sent here, you are sent here, and that's, we've got text of scripture to show that. We are here to preserve and present the revelation that was given to us, that was once for all entrusted to the saints. That's what we're to do. Now, however you go about doing that, that's going to be your own leading, the Spirit leading you, but it has to be aimed towards this. Okay, chapter 2, verse 3. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, talking to that individual he's arguing with, and yet you do the same things, I mean, you're able to look at the Gentiles and say, those are wicked, wicked people. But me, I know that's wrong, so I, I've made a distinction. I, I'm, I'm not that bad. Now we're putting a level on it. But yet you do the same thing. You show, uh, yet you do the same things. Do you think you'll escape God's judgment? Again, he's talking, we're in chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. So he's still in a general sense. He's aiming towards the Jews. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? Verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart. Now again, there's that similar word, stubbornness and unrepentant heart. Now this is the first time the word, just novelty, unrepentant, that's the first time that word appears in Greek literature anywhere. Now, we may discover something that earlier Homer used or something, but so far it's never been found except in Paul's letter right here. He used it a couple other places, but this is the first time it appears in Greek writing. So sometimes we see, and this is something that we know, is sometimes words are coined by Paul. Paul uses certain words that have never been created. He uses them, creates a word to fit what he's trying to say, which is an interesting thing. But he says here, but because of your stubbornness and unrepented heart, now that sounds very much like chapter 1 when he says God made it plain to them since God has made it, God made it is, what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain 
He says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him and talks about them becoming fools and their hearts pumping foolishness through or darkness through their, their system. Here's the same thing. But now he's talking to those who are at a different level. They're able to say, that's wrong. This is right. But yet you and your own stubbornness and your unrepentant hearts, and that's what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be repenting. God's kindness during time leads you to repentance. But instead of repenting, you show contempt for God's tolerance. And now, because of your stubbornness, your refusal to change, and your unrepentant heart, you, here it is, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's, God's day, wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Now, right, notice right there, the word storing up is, in its pure meaning, in its meaning, storing up means storing up wealth. Storing up riches, storing up the gold. You're storing up good things. You're, you're putting away the harvest. And this is really funny. This is ironic stuff. Because he uses it, you're storing up wrath. It's like a safety deposit box. You're putting in your safety deposit box all, all the good things, all the things I want to protect. You're putting in your safety deposit box all the information that will accuse you in court. You're storing up for yourself all the evidence. And when you pull out, say, see, I've got in my safety deposit box, well, there's all the documents we need to put you away for life. Why did I save those? If I would have got rid of those, there'd be no evidence. But instead, when you show contempt for God's kindness during this time of his tolerance, you're storing up not wealth, not rewards. You're storing up evidence. You're storing up wrath that on the day of wrath, they'll be brought out. It's like, well, here's what you save for yourself. Boom, and there it is. It's, it's, it's ironic. It's funny stuff. It's not, you're not storing up wealth. You're storing up accusations against yourself that will be poured out on you. When you stand before God for a judge, say, what does God think? He'll have all kinds of documentation to judge you by. See, is there judgment? It's, yeah, the whole concept, well, there's no judgment, there's no hell. God accepts everybody. He's tolerant to everybody, giving you time to repent and come to the truth. But if you show contempt for that, that contempt is storing up wrath for yourself. He's holding it back. Just put it on the shelf. Maybe they'll change. Put it on the shelf. They'll change. Put it, they don't change. Well, now's the time of wrath. Well, let's read it again. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. His wrath is coming. Why don't you repent and get in the truth and duck out of the way? But instead, you're stubborn. You're unrepentant. You're just asking for more. He's giving you time, and you're mocking it. When the righteous judgment will be revealed, and then there's a real popular word right here in, in this, this book, the word revealed. God's wrath is being revealed even today. We know it's coming. Now his wrath is going to be revealed in the sense of manifesting. God will give to each person according to what he has done. Now, if we would, please, go to your notes. And that's really one of the important points of this whole thing. God will give to each person according to what he has done. And if you look on page one uh, of the notes, right there in the middle, where we left off last week, three, uh, the three principles of judgment is God's judgment is based on truth. Meaning his, re he based on his, his judgment is based in his reality. We have no excuse, excuse not to know it. Uh, Next one, God's judgment is based on performance. Each man will be based on what he has done. Again, that sounds like a, a message of works, but it's not a message of doing good works to get to heaven, but it's a matter of basically the idea of seeking God. Is if, you're, if wrath is being revealed, you say, I want to repent, you're moving towards the light. So God's judgment is based in truth. It's based on your performance. Again, be careful. It's such a dangerous word in the Protestant world or any world of religion. But it's based on your response. Well, right here. His time of tolerance is waiting for you to repent. If you don't repent, I mean, it's not like you've got to go off and do a bunch of good things to respond to this. You just have to say, whoa, I'm coming back into the truth. We can call it faith. We eventually call it faith. You're, you're accepting it. You're coming towards it. And then number three, God's judgment is, is impartial. God does not show favoritism. Which is going to lead us into, as we get through these verses here, is going to lead us into the concept of the Jews who think. This is what we're being set up for. The Jews think two things. We have the written revelation. 
God spoke to Moses. We have it written right down here. We are his chosen people. Right? Okay. Well, we're, he gave it to us. He didn't give it to the Gentiles. Right, but you were supposed to do something with it. We did. We got it. <laughs> okay, and now they're right back thing. You've got, now you've created an idol out of your religion, out of your revelation from God. It's like, he, he chose us. And, and this is going to set us up for the last chapters here. When we talk about predestination, you, there's be a thousand out of a thousand, two uh, different directions you can go with that. But the ideal here is the, that maybe a thousand people want to argue against it. But it's like you come with uh, the ideal of they're, they're the chosen people and they've got the revelation. It's like, yeah, but you still have to respond to it. You still have to individually. The is, nation of Israel is going to be chosen, but it's not those that have been chosen. It's those who actually do it, that respond to it. So you can be in Israel, and we know this from Jesus' own teaching, his own experience. You can be in Israel, you can be the high priest in Israel, and still kill the Messiah, and walk away and feel like you did the right thing. It's like, uh, you're in trouble. And Jesus talks about those, the rich man who went to Hades, and, and was in a place of torment. And the poor man who went to the place of Abraham's side, or paradise. It's like, they were both Jews. And you see the Jews, really. I mean, I don't know if we understand it, but the Jews, to hear Jesus... Step up and present himself as a rabbi and present some kind of a story. And see, people will argue about this too. Some kind of a story that a Jew could end up being separated from God in eternity. It's like, oh no. Absolutely, absolutely no, no way. We're the chosen people. And Paul's going to say, it's not those who hear the law. It's those who do it. That's, that's going to come up here. And then he's going to attack circumcision. Well, we're the, we're the circumcised people. We've all been circumcised. He says it's a circumcision of the heart. It's something bigger than just being circumcised in the flesh. It's something you've got to do. You've got to embrace it. And that's where this rest of this chapter, by the time we get down to these verses here, he's clearly attacking the Jews. So, let's look, not attacking the Jews, but challenging the Jews. Let's read this again. Verse 6, God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence, we'll pick this up next week, to those who by persistence in doing good, Seek. Remember the word seek. Those who seek God will find him. Jesus says, knock, seek, ask. Those who seek glory, honor, and immortality, characteristics of God, he will give eternal life. If you seek it, you will get eternal life. Now again, we know the bridge between seeking and eternal life is Jesus Christ. So it's not like you can do certain things outside of Christianity and find salvation. You've got to seek God Find Jesus Christ and you will receive this eternal life. But he, Paul's not there yet. He's just saying, if you're seeking it, you will find it. But for those who are self-seeking, again, those are the ones who are going to show contempt for the time of tolerance. You're looking at it for yourself. You're not interested in God. You show contempt for those things. For those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth, reality, and follow evil, idolatry, false reality, your own truth, there will be wrath and anger. There, here it is. There will be trouble and distress for every human being. So we're still talking in chapters 1 through 11, just a general sense. Every human being who does evil. But here's a key phrase right here. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Now, if you go back to chapter 1, for chapter 1, verse 16, we're talking about now chapter 1, verse 16, a famous verse. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Okay, yay, go Jews, okay? Now we get over to chapter 2. But now if you reject his general revelation, you reject his special revelation, you turn his general revelation of, of just creation into some kind of idolatry, or you take the written revelation given to Moses and turn it into some form of idolatry, there will be judgment. There will be wrath and distress. Verse 9, there will be, I'm back in chapter 2, verse 9, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. The only thing you see right in there, if he's, and he says there's no favoritism. You know, you put both the Jew and the Gentile are under the same scale of judgment. The only difference, if you want to make any distinction, is the Jews will always go first, and then the Gentiles. 
But it's the same. Salvation comes first to the Jews and then goes to the Gentiles. When God comes in judgment, first for the Jews and then we'll judge the Gentiles. And when we want to reward them, we'll reward the Jews and then the Gentiles. But there's no favoritism. There's no advantage, and Paul's going to address this later in the book, there's no advantage in being a Jew except for the fact that you're standing right next to the revelation from the days of the beginning, whenever you want to consider the beginning, if it be writing the revelation down and maybe even in Adam's day, going through Noah, going through Abraham, you're close to getting up to the place of Solomon where you've got the temple worship. You're right there walking, right touching it. There is an advantage, you're right there, except that advantage can also make you uh, harden your heart. You can become callous to it and form your own, just like we can form idolatry out of the general revelation, they can form an idolatry out of temple worship or the word of God, and that's where Paul's dealing with here. Again, chapter 1 is the Gentiles, but chapter 2 here, he's walking, marching towards the Jew, but even at these early verses, 1 through 11, he'd be talking about any one of us who have some kind of understanding of right and wrong. If you can judge, and that doesn't just mean negative, you can judge, say, ah, oh, that's good. Well, now you have the ability to judge right and wrong. You now need to start using that on yourself, because if you don't, uh, you're going to end up hardening your heart and walking past this time of God's tolerance and grace, thinking, I'll just keep myself asleep, put myself into a state of stupor, busy myself, that's a dangerous thing, we all know that, getting busy with life, then all of a sudden, the day of judgment comes, I would assume we've all accepted Jesus Christ, but now comes that time of, now that you've accepted Christ, have you turned the page, what, what's next, what's next in the text, what, what is God wanting me to do, what's the next part of the revelation, well I've accepted Christ, I'm going to heaven, well, it's pretty clear we, we go to heaven through faith in Jesus Christ, but it's pretty clear that when we get there, we will be evaluated. We can go right from this verse, start right here, based on what we have done. Again, there's different levels in heaven, if you want to say it that way. There is, there's those that are well done, a good and faithful servant, and those that have squandered. First Corinthians, went through First Corinthians. They'll pass through the fires, and they'll lose everything in their life, but they themselves will be saved, but their entire ministry will be consumed. Because it's like, yeah, that wasn't right. You accepted Christ, then built your own fictional ministry based on your own fictional ideas, based on your own culture. And that passed through the fire. The wood, hay, and straw burned up. The gold, silver, and costly stones will pass through. They'll become your reward, and you'll be saved. But the one whose wood, hay, and straw is consumed, they'll be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. You were saved because you, had, you built your house on the rock, but you built your house out of... Wood, hay, and straw. The difference there was wood, hay, and straw is what they built common people's homes out. The gold, silver, costly stones is what you built the temples out of, the things that belong to deity. If you're building for right now selfish motives in your ministry, in your Christian life, yes, you'll be saved. You built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. There's no other foundation except him. But what you built was temporary. Boom, it's gone. But when you pass through and you built building with gold, silver, costly stones, you're building for God, you're building something for God's purpose. It will pass from this age into the next, and that will become your reward. So again, it's not just a matter of accepting Christ, it's a matter of accepting Christ and then continuing to grow and find out where you're at and what you should be doing. Like I said before, it's a continual life of repentance. You turn the page, you read a little more, it's like, oh my gosh, change. Now, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm such a wicked man. There's a place for that too. But you turn the page, it's like, repent what? It means change your mind. I used to think this. Well, that was stupid. I see that's wrong. I'm not going to think this way. That's repentance. That's what repenting of, even of Christ. The Jews, on the, we know on the Temple Mount, when the apostles first were preaching, they heard Peter preach and they <coughs> repented. They didn't all rush forward in an altar call and say, oh, I'm going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop doing work on Saturday. I'm gonna. They, 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 what they did, they repented. What that mean? They used to think Jesus was a false Messiah. They repented. Oh, my gosh. He's the son of the living God. And they repented of their views of Jesus Christ and were saved. Okay, I'll pray and we'll pick this up next week. Thank you for being here. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We do thank you again for the opportunity to look into your word. We ask that we again may walk in the ways that you've called us to, that we'll accept the revelation, and that we'll use this time of your tolerance and your patience to grow in Christ and to produce the works that you want us to do at this time in history. Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity. And as we continue again to seek you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here.